Okay, I seem to be back here, uh, caught up, whatever you want. Uh, hello, everybody. I see people are leaving messages already. Look at all these nice, nice folks. Michael, Todd, Barb, and Stephen, Jerry, and Jim, and Kelly. So hello to all of you. Um, before I want to, before I start tonight, um, I just wanted to say um, I just got news during the afternoon, or I finally stumbled across the news this afternoon that one of my uh, Facebook friends and a very good Facebook friend, somebody I care about a lot, um, Alexis has had a medical emergency. Um, I don't know the latest news, um, and so I just want to say that uh, you know my thoughts and everything are are with Alexis and just hoping for the very, very best. I don't have any information yet beyond the fact of uh, the medical crisis itself. And so I'm, I'm waiting to hear. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it except to say, Alexis, be better, be well, worrying about you. And so that's that as far as that goes. Um, I had a question here from uh, Jim and one from Todd. Um, and uh, Todd, you were asking about the animated film version. Well, as long story short, um, we got to the point where we had uh, basically a contract to do the animated film, um, fairly expensive you know, big money kind of thing in terms of the production, not necessarily for us, but the production. Um, but it fell through because a big chunk, if not most of the money was from uh, Saudi Arabia. And um, at the point that that was all just being done and that information came out was the same time in which the journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi was murdered in the embassy. And uh, all of us that were involved with the project at that point um, said we can't go forward with this at this point because, well, because it was a murder. It was a political murder. And um, it very much seemed to have been done by the exact same people that uh, had put together the, the fund that was being used for um, at least that iteration of the story. So although we don't have any specific information on Tell Chaser Song, we may have some information on some other projects, which I will let you know as soon as I do. But at the moment, um, that particular long, a very long process, uh, unfortunately came to a sad end. Um, real life events, of course, much bigger and much sadder than, than our little brush with the whole thing. Um, so don't want to uh, make the magnitude of what happened to Mr. Khashoggi sound like it's comparable to um, our project falling through. But in fact, it was one of those things where once that happened, there was no way we could go through with the project. Um, as, and as I said, there are other things that may or may not happen. As soon as I have some information that I can reliably share, um, I will on any of my books or things and the possibility of any of them being turned into something else. I realize that sounds very vague and confusing and I don't mean it to. Um, apologies, not only have I been worrying about uh, Alexis, but we had a busy day here at the house and then I crashed out for like half an hour, an hour and woke up with a terrible case of bed beard. Those of you who are cursed with hair, um, you know, I know that you often talk about bed hair and the, the, the horror of bed hair, but I can tell you it's nothing compared to the horror of bed beard. Um, and uh, my beard is like copper wire, so if I, <laughs> when it's bent to one side, it, it reflects well on nobody. So, but again, in a more serious vein, um, all, everything I'm saying here is of less import than you know, the fact that uh, we, we lost the Tail Chaser song deal because of a tragedy, and I'm worrying about our friend Alexis. So, uh, but, you know, I did the best I could with the beer. So anyway, all, all of you, here I am, and I'm going to give you a brief precy of what I read last night, because for those of you who are attending this reading, 
which um, I will call the Sunday evening reading as compared to the very, very early Sunday morning reading, which I could almost call the Saturday night reading. Um, I decided at sort of the last moment yesterday that I was going to start reading Tale Chaser Song, but for a couple of reasons. One, because Tale Chaser Song is my first book, and it's a longish book, not as long as my later ones, but it's, you know, it's like two or three times the length of Caliban's Hour um, and things like that. Um, I decided I did not want to only read it for one group of readers. You know, as I said, I've got the early morning folk um, who are many of them in Europe, and I've got the this slot that we're in right now, which is mostly, or at least a lot of the people are in U.S. time zones. So I didn't want to read it twice. I didn't want to give it only to one group. Um, so I am instead reading it in tandem. Um, all the episodes that will not be in your normal time slot, though, will be recorded. They'll be available on my Facebook page. They're available on YouTube. And I think they're also available through tadwilliams.com, uh, which is no spaces, just and no caps or anything, just tadwilliams.com. And uh, so you can keep up that way if you want to. If not, you can just pretend I'm reading a kind of a pointless short story each week for the next several weeks. It's up to you. Anyway, um, with that, I think I am ready to move forward with tonight's reading. Um, I am reading from the 15th anniversary edition of Tail Chaser Song. And... Uh, I read, when I read the first chapter, I also read the introduction, which is the, which I'll explain in a moment, but also the introduction that was more of an author's note written for the 20th, the fifth, yeah, the 15th anniversary edition. Now, the funny thing about the 15th anniversary edition is it came out 20 years ago. So there's been more time now since it came out than it between when I published it and when this sort of celebratory edition came out. If you add those two together, you know how long it's been since my first book was published, which was 1985, when I was in my sort of mid-20s. So, and that should answer whoever's question was, how old were you? I was mid-20s, I'm not exactly certain. I got the uh, notation, the notification, the letter from Don Walheim, um, January of 1985. And the book itself came out in, I believe, October of 1985. And that was my first publication, and I was fortunate, fortunate enough to be Daw's, uh, Daw, D-A-W is my publisher, uh, my American publisher. I was fortunate enough to be their first ever, second ever, hardcore book after C.J. Cherry's Angel, Angel with a Sword, I believe it was. Anyway, but, Tail Chaser Song, and that's what we're reading tonight. Now, in the first part... As I said, I read a longish introduction, which I'm not going to read again, since I've already put it all down on, on uh, video once. And then I read the introduction, and the introduction, um, in this case, is the one that's part of the original book, and it is the one that explains a little bit about the pantheon of cats. And in this case, um, the, the main thing that you need to know about the pantheon of cats, they have a pantheon of sort of cat gods, much like the classical pantheons of many, many other cultures. And uh, the two main ones are Harar, Golden Eye, the, the, the male cat god figure, and Fela Sky Dancer, uh, the female cat god figure. And their three firstborn children, Vera White Wind, who's the kind of martyred, lost cat um, who had, was so badly injured by his younger brother, Grizzraz Heart Eater, that he eventually, although he survived, he no longer could live on the earth and has gone to live in the sky. This is cat mythology. And that uh, then there was a third cat, Tangalure Firefoot, um, who disappeared after his brother died and has been wandering the, the earth ever since. Then, in the introduction, we met Fritty, Tail Chaser, and Fritty, his first name, Tail Chaser, his, uh, it's uh, face name, oh god, now I can't even remember, we'll get, it, it'll come up, <laughs> it'll come up in the story. Like I said, it's been a long time, uh, but Fritty Tail Chaser is a young 
cat of the folk, the meeting wall folk are his particular clan. And uh, he is one of those cats who's kind of on the line between being wild and living with human beings who are called big ones. And during that first chapter, we heard a story being told to the meeting wall clan by one of the, by the clan's sort of shaman or storyteller, which explained how human beings were descended from a very proud, a very arrogant, very large cat named Prince Ninebirds, who uh, was so um, uppity that he was punished by Tangalore Firefoot, one of the firstborn, by being stretched and pounded and pummeled until he was so ugly that he had to go live away from the rest of the cats. And from that point on, he was called Man, M A M apostrophe A N, which means out of the sunlight in cat language, and had to go off by himself and became the progenitor of all humans. And because of the curse, um, humans must always serve cats. And that was the story that was told at the meeting wall in the first chapter, um, an old clan folk tale. But the other bit of information that was important is that Tail Chaser was trying to find his friend Hushpat, a female cat with whom he is very smitten and with whom he was having a, a kind of a beginning of a relationship, but she has disappeared. And that was what happened. And at the end of the first chapter, uh, Tail Chaser's friend Finbone had agreed to go and hunt with him or help him look for Hushpad the next day. So that's where we are on chapter one. That was the end of chapter one. And now I'm going to read chapter two. At the beginning of each chapter, there are poems, most of them quite short. And I will be reading that after the chapter number uh, each time we encounter one, just so you know, and I'll give you the quotation of what it's from. Some of them are poems, some of them are quotes. And uh, later on, I'll tell you an amusing story about the quotes and chapters, uh, at the chapter quotes in these books. So anyway, Tail Chaser Song, originally published 1985. This is the 2000 edition, which was the 15th anniversary um, and as I said in the introduction that I read, it's still amazing to me that this little imaginary cat has been around the world so many times. Um, and, uh, you know, I never get over that. This cat who was born on my kitchen table in uh, Menlo Park, California in 1985 when I would come home from my, my night jobs, because um, I was working two or three jobs at a time, I would come home at night and work for a couple of hours on it. And uh, he's been in print ever since, and he's been in a couple of dozen languages at least, and he's been all over the world, and a lot of kids read him in the, uh, our equivalent of elementary school um, here or abroad. So anyway, now on to Tail Chaser, Chapter 2. It is the vague and elusive. Meet it, and you will not see its head. Follow it, and you will not see its back. Lao Tzu. Freddy Tail Chaser had been born the second youngest of a litter of five. When his mother, Inde's grass nestle, had first sniffed him and licked the moisture from his newborn pelt, she sensed in him a difference, a subtle shading that she could not name. His blind infant eyes and questing mouth were somehow more insistent than those of his brothers and sisters. As she cleaned him, she felt a tickle in her whiskers, as an intimation of things unseen. Perhaps he will be a great hunter, she thought. His father, Brindleside, was certainly a handsome, healthy cat. There had even been a whiff of the elder days about him, especially when he had sung the ritual with her on that winter night. But Brindleside was gone now, following his nose toward some obscure desire, and she, of course, was left to raise his progeny alone. As Freddy grew, she lost touch with her early perceptions. Familiarity and the hard day-to-day -day business of raising a litter blunted many of Grass Nestle's subtler sensitivities. Although Freddy was a bright and friendly kitten, clever and quick learning, he never fulfilled in size the promise of his hunter father. By the time that the eye had opened above him three times, he was still no larger than his older sister, Tyria, and considerably smaller than either of his two brothers. His short fur had darkened from the original cream to apricot orange, 
except for white bands on his legs and tail and a small milky star shape on his forehead. Not large, but swift and agile, conceding some kitten clumsiness, Freddy danced through his first season of life. He frolicked with his siblings, chased bugs and leaves and other small moving things, and mustered his green patience to learn the exacting lore of hunting that Indez grass nestle taught to the children. Although the fam family's nest was in a heap of wood and rubble behind one of the massive dwellings of the big ones, many days Freddy's mother would take the kittens out past the outskirts of the man nests and into the open countryside. Wood lore was quite as important as city lore to the children of the folk. Their survival depended on their being smarter, faster, and quieter whenever, wherever they found themselves. Forth from the nest, Grass Nestle would go, her young forming a straggling, cavorting scout party about her. With the patience passed down through countless generations, she taught her ragged crew the fundamentals of survival. The sudden freeze, the startling leap, True smelling, clear seeing, quick killing, all the hunting lore she knew. She taught and showed and tested, then patiently retaught time and again until the lesson stuck. Certainly her patience was often stretched thin, and occasionally a botched lesson would be punished by a brisk paw smack to the offender's nose. Even a mother of the folk had limits to her restraint. Of all grass nestles kittens, Fritty loved learning most. Inattention, however, sometimes gained him a smarting nose, especially when the family went out into the fields and woods. The tempting whistles and chirps of the flafas and the swarming evocative sense of the countryside could set him daydreaming in a moment, singing to himself of treetops and wind in his fur. These reveries were frequently interrupted by his mother's brisk paw on his snout, she had learned to recognize that far away look. The dividing line between waking and dreaming was a fine one among the folk. Although they knew that dream squeakers did not satisfy waking hunger and that dream fights left no wounds, still there was nourishment and release in dreams unavailable in the waking world. The folk depended so much on the near intangible. Senses, hunches, feelings, and impulses and these contrasted so strongly with the rock-solid basics of survival needs that one supported the other in an inseparable whole. All the folk had exceedingly keen senses. They lived and died by them. Only a few, though, grew to become old varis, far sensors, who developed their acuteness and sensitivity far beyond even the high median of the folk. Fritty was a great dreamer, and for a while his mother harbored the idea that perhaps he had this gift of far sensing. He showed occasional flashes of surprising depth. Once he hissed his eldest brother down from a tall tree, and a moment later the branch on which his brother had stood broke loose and fell to the ground. There were other hints of this deeper var, but as time went on and he began to grow out of kittenhood, the incidents became fewer. He became more prone to distraction, more of a daydreamer and less of a dream reader. His mother decided that she had been mistaken, and as the time of Fritty's naming grew closer, she forgot it entirely. The life of the hunting mother did not permit brooding over abstractions. After the first meeting, at the first meeting, after their third eye, young cats were brought to be named. The naming was a ceremony of great importance. It was sung among the folk that all cats had three names, the heart name, the face name, and the tail name. The heart name was given by the mother at the kitten's birth. It was a name of the ancient tongue of the cats, the higher singing. It was only to be shared with siblings, heart friends, and those who joined in the ritual. Fritty was such a name. The face name was given by the elders at the young one's first meeting, a name in the mutual language of all warm-blooded creatures, the common singing. It could be used anywhere a name was useful. 
As for the tail name, most of the folk maintained that all cats were born with one. It was merely a matter of discovering it. Discovery was a very personal thing. Once affected, it was never discussed or shared with anyone. It was certain, at least, that some folk never discovered their tail name and died knowing only the other two. Many said that a cat who had lived with the big ones, with man, lost all desire to find it and grew fat in ignorance. So important, secret, and rare were the folk's tail names and so hesitantly discussed that much, nothing much about them was actually agreed upon. One either discovered this name or did not, said the elders, and there was no way to force the matter. On the night of the naming, Fritty and his litter mates were led by their mother to the special nose meat of the elders that preceded the meeting. For the first time, Fritty saw Bristlejaw, the old Sirva, and old Snifflick and the other wise folk who protected the laws and tradition. Fritty and his siblings, as well as the litter of another Fela, were herded into a circle. They lay hunched against each other as the elders walked slowly around them, sniffing the air and sounding a deep rumble that had the cadence of an unknown language. Snifflick leaned down and put his paw against Tyria, Fritty's sister, and brought her to her paws. He stared at her for a moment, then said, I name you Clear Song. Join the meeting. She rushed away to share her new name, and the elders continued. One by one, they pulled the other young out of the pile, where they lay, breathing shallowly with expectation, and named them. Finally, there was only Fritty left. The elders stopped their circling and sniffed him carefully. Bristlejaw turned to the others. Do you smell it too? Snifflick nodded. Yes, the wide water, the places underground. A strange sign. Another elder, a battered blue named Earpoint, scuffed the earth impatiently. Not important. We're here for a naming. True, Bristlejaw agreed. Well, I smell searching. I smell a struggle with dreams. This from Snifflet. I think he desires his tail name before he has even received his face name, said another elder, and they all sneezed quietly with humor. Very well, said Snifflet, and all eyes turned to Freddy. I name you Tail Chaser. Join the meeting. Bewildered, Freddy leaped up and trotted rapidly away from the nose meat, away from the chuckling elders who seemed to share a joke at his expense. Bristlejaw called sharply after him. Freddy tail chaser! He turned and met the master old singer's gaze. Despite the merriment wrinkling his nose, his eyes were warm and kind. Tail chaser! All things in Earth's season, only given time. Remember that, won't you? Freddy flattened his ears and turned and ran to the meeting. The waning days of spring brought hot weather, long trips into the countryside, and Tail Chaser's first meeting with Hushpad. As he drew closer to his maturity, the daily company of his brothers and sisters became less important to Freddy. Each day the sun was longer in the sky, and the scents carried by the drowsy wind grew sweeter and stronger. So, increasingly, he was drawn on solitary rambles outside the range of dwellings among which his family lived and slept. During the hottest part of the hour of smaller shadows, his hunger blunted by his morning meal, his natural curiosity freed, he would range through the grasslands like his brethren of the savannas, holding imaginary sway over all before him as he stood on a hillside, grass stems tickling his belly. The deeps of the woods also lured him. He delved at bases of trees for the secrets of scurrying beetles and tried the strength of outer branches, feeling the intriguing breezes of the upper air swirl through the sensitive hairs of his face and ears. One day, after an afternoon of, of intoxicating freedom and exploration, Tail Chaser emerged from the low scrub that girdled his woods and stopped to pull a twig loose from his tail. As he sat, splay-legged, pulling at the bit of branch with his teeth, 
he heard a voice. Very foul, stranger. Might you be tail chasing? Alarmed, Freddy leaped to his feet and whirled around. A fela, gray with black striping, sat regarding him from the stump of a long dead oak. He had been so wrapped in his thoughts that he had not noticed her as he passed, though she perched a mere four or five jumps away. Good dancing, mistress. How do you know my name? I'm afraid I don't know yours. The bramble in his tail hanging, forgotten, Freddy observed the stranger carefully. She was young, seemingly no older than he. She had tiny, slim paws and a softly rounded body. There is no great mystery regarding either name, said the Fela with an amused expression. Mine is Hushpat, and has been since my naming. As to yours, well, I have seen you from a distance at meeting, and you have been mentioned for your love of rambling and exploring, and here I have caught you at it. She sneezed delicately. Her attractive green eyes turned away. Tail Chaser noticed her tail, which she held coiled around her as she spoke. Now it rose as if of its own volition and waved languorously in the air. It was long and slender, ending in a tender point, and ringed from base to tip with the same black accents as her sides and haunches. This tail, whose lazy beckoning instantly captured Freddy's admiration, was to lead him into more trouble than his own bounding imagination could conceive. The pair romped and talked all through the hour of unfolding dark. Tail Chaser, Tail Chaser found himself opening his heart to his newfound friend, and even he was surprised at what spilled out. Dreams, hopes, ambitions, all mixed together and hardly differentiated from each other. And always Hushpad listened and nodded, as if he spoke the dearest kind of truth. When he parted from her at final dancing, he made her promise to meet him again the next day. She said she would, and he ran all the way home, leaping with delight, arriving at the nest so excited that he woke his sleeping brothers and sisters and alarmed his mother. But when she heard what it was that made him squirm and tickle so that he could not sleep, his mother only smiled and pulled him to her with a gentle paw. She licked behind his ear and purred, of course, of course, to him over and over until he finally crossed into the dream world. Despite his apprehensions of the following afternoon, which seemed to pass as slowly as snowmelt, Hushpad was indeed there to meet him when the eye first appeared over the horizon. She came the day after, too, and the one after that. Through all of high summer, they ran together and danced, and played. Friends watched them and said that this was no mere attraction to be consummated and then ended when the young Fela finally came into her season. Pretty and Hushpad seemed to have found a deeper congruency, which might ripen later into a joining, a thing rarely seen, especially among the younger folk. Tail Chaser was picking his way through the litter of the dwellings of the big ones in the fragmented darkness of final dancing. He had spent the night roaming the woods with Hushpad, and as usual, his thoughts lingered with the young Fela. He was struggling with something, but did not know what it was. He cared for Hushpad, more than for any of his friends or even his siblings. But her companionship was somehow different from the others. The sight of her tail twining delicately behind her as she sat, or held delicately upright when she walked, tickled a part of his imaginings he could not put a name to. Deep in these deliberations, for a long while, he did not heed the message that the wind carried. When the fear smell finally reached his pondering, puzzling mind, he started with sudden alarm and shook his head from side to side. His whiskers were tingling. He leaped forward, galloping toward home, toward his nest, he seemed to hear terror cries of the folk, but the air was still and quiet. He clambered across the last rooftop, down a fence with a scratch and bump, and stopped short in amazement and fear. Where the pile of rubble that had been his family's nest had stood, there was nothing. The spot was swept as clean as wind-scoured rock. 
When he had left his family that morning, his mother had been standing atop the heap, grooming his youngest sister, Soft Whisker. Now they were all gone. He darted forward and fell to scratching at the mute ground as if to unearth some secret of what had happened, but it was man ground and could not be broken by claw or tooth. His mind felt blurry with conflicting passions. He whimpered and sniffed the air. The atmosphere was full of cold traces of fear. The smells of his family and nesting place still hung, but they were overlaid with the awful sense of fright and anger. Although the impressions were much jumbled by the action of time and winds, he could also sense who had done this thing. Man had been here. The big ones had lingered for a long time, but had themselves left no mark of fear or anger. Their reek, as always, was nearly indecipherable of meaning, more like the busy ants and borer beetles than like the folk. Here his mother had fought them to the end to protect her young, but the big ones had felt no anger, no fear, and now his family was gone. In the next days he found no trace of them, as he had feared he would not. He fled to the old woods and lived there alone. Eating only what he could catch with his still clumsy paws, he grew thin and weak, but he could not come he would not come to the nests of other folk. Thinbone and other friends occasionally brought him food, but could not persuade him to return. The elders sniffed sagely and kept their peace. They knew wounds of this type were best nursed in solitude, where the decision to live or die was freely made and not regretted later. Fritty did not see Hushpat at all, for she did not come to visit him in his wild state. Whether out of sorrow for his situation or indifference, he did not know. He tortured himself with imagined reasons when he could not sleep. One day, almost an opening and a closing of Nearslar's eye, since he had lost his family, Tailchaser found himself on the outskirts of the dwellings of man. Sick and debilitated, he had wandered out of the protection of the forest in a kind of daze. As he lay, breathing raggedly, in a patch of welcome sunlight, he heard the sound of heavy footfalls. His dimmed senses announced the approach of man. The big ones drew near, and he heard them cry to each other in their deep, booming voices. He closed his eyes. If it was fated that he should join his family in death, it seemed appropriate that these creatures complete the job that their kind had begun. As he felt large hands grasp him and the smell of the man became all-pervading, he began to pass over, whether to the dream world or beyond, he did not know. Then he knew nothing at all. Slowly, cautiously, Tail Chaser's spirit flew back to familiar fields. As thought came back, he could feel a soft surface beneath him, and the man smell still all about. Frightened, he opened his eyes and stared wildly around. He was on a piece of soft fabric at the bottom of a container. It gave him a trapped, terrified feeling. Pulling himself onto his unsteady paws, he tried to climb out. He was too weak to jump, but after several attempts, he managed to get his forepaws over the edge of the container and scramble out. On the floor below, he looked around and found himself standing in an open, roofed-over area attached to one of the dwellings of the big ones. Although the smell of man was everywhere, there were none in sight. He was about to hobble away to freedom when he felt a powerful urge, hunger. He smelled food. Casting his eye about the porch, he saw another smaller container. The food smell was making his mouth water but he approached it cautiously. After sniffing the contents suspiciously, he took a tentative bite and found it very good. At first, he kept an ear cocked for the return of the man, but after a while abandoned himself completely to the pleasure of eating. He bolted down the food, cleaning the container to the bottom, then found another full of clear water and drank. This gorging on top of his enfeebled state almost made him sick, 
But the big ones who had put the meal down, perhaps foreseeing this, had provided only modest amounts. After he drank, he wobbled out into the sunlight and rested for a moment, then rose to make his way up to the forest. Suddenly, one of his captors walked around the corner of the bulky man nest, for he wanted to bolt, but his body's fragile health would not permit it. To his amazement, however, the big one did not seize him or kill him where he stood. The man merely passed by, leaning to stroke the top of Tailchaser's head, and then was gone. So began the uneasy truce between Fritty Tailchaser and the big ones. These men, on whose porch he had found himself, never hindered his coming or going. They put out food for him to take if he wished, and left the box for him to sleep in if he so desired. After much hard thought, Freddy decided that perhaps the big ones were a little like the folk. Some were good and meant no idle harm, while some were not, and it was this second kind that had brought ruin to his family and his birthing place. He found a kind of peace in this balance, Thoughts of his loss began to recede from his waking hours, if not from his dreams. As health came back to him, Freddy found once more found pleasure in the society of the folk. He found Hushpad also, unchanged in whisker or tail. She asked him to pardon her for not visiting him during his upset days in the woods. She said she would not have been able to bear the sight of her playfellow in such distress. Pardon her he did, and happily. With his strength returned, they once more ran together in the countryside. All was as it had been, except the tail chaser was more given to silences and a little less to happy chattering. Still, his time with Hushpad was now even more precious to Fritty. They talked now from time to time about the ritual that they would enter when Hushpad came to her season and tail chaser became a hunter. And so their high summer waned, and the wind began to sing autumn music in the treetops. On the last night before meeting night, Fritty and Hushpad climbed the hillside overlooking the man dwellings. They sat silently in the dark of deepest quiet for a long while as the lights below flickered out one by one. Finally, Tail Chaser raised his young voice in song. So high, above the waving treetops, above the teeming sky, we speak a word. Side by side, upon the rugged world back, beyond the sun and tide, this voice is heard. We are traveling together with our tails in the wind. We are voyaging together. We are sun redeemed and warm. Long now. We have danced within the forest, looking only straight ahead, lacking but the word. Soon, though, we will understand the meaning in our whiskers and our bones, now that we have heard. When Tail Chaser finished his song, they again sat quietly through the remaining hours of the night. The morning sun rose to scatter the shadows and interrupt them, but when he turned to rub Hushpad's nose in farewell, an unspoken promise hung between their commingling whiskers. Chapter three. They who dream by day are cognizant of many things which escape those who dream only by night. Edgar Allan Poe. The morning after meeting, Freddy awoke from a strange dream in which Prince Ninebirds of Bristlejaw's song had taken Hushpad and was running away with her in his great mouth. When Freddy's dream self had tried to pull her free, Ninebirds had seized him and given a savage yank. He had felt his dream form painfully stretching, stretching, becoming as thin and attenuated as smoke. Shaking himself all over, as if to scatter the dismaying fantasy, Tail Chaser rose and performed his early morning grooming, smoothing down the sleep-ruffled fur all along his body, 
coaxing errant whiskers into place and ending with a fillet that put his tail tip in perfect order. Walking through the tall grass behind his sleeping porch, he could not shed the sense of foreboding that his dream had cast over the day. It seemed important for some reason he could not remember. He should not and could not forget the dream. Why? Practicing paw swipes at an accommodatingly bouncy dandelion, he remembered. Hush pad. She had not been at the meeting. He must go and look for her, discover what had happened. He felt a little less apprehensive than he had the previous night. After all, he decided, there were many possible reasons for her absence. She did live in a man dwelling. They might have closed her in, prevented her leaving. Big ones were capricious that way. Tail Chaser made his way across the field of grass and through a copse of low trees as he skirted the old woods. It was some distance to where Hushpad lived, and the journey took him a good part of the morning. At last he came in sight of the man nest, standing by itself in the solitude of surrounding fields. It looked strangely empty, and as he approached he could find no trace of familiar smells. Calling, Hushpad! Tail Chaser here! Nifao, heart friend, he jogged closer, but was met with silence. He noticed the entrance hanging open, as was not usual in the nests of man. Reaching the dwelling, he cautiously poked his head inside, then entered. Not only was the man dwelling empty of life, to tail chaser it seemed empty of everything. The floors and walls were bare, and even his soft footfalls echoed as he moved from room to room. For a fearful moment, the emptiness reminded him of the disappearance of his family. But something was different. There were no smells of terror or excitement, no trace of anything upsetting having occurred. Whatever reason the man had for leaving, it seemed a natural one. But where was Hushpad? A top-to-bottom search produced nothing but more empty rooms. Curious and puzzled, Freddy left the dwelling. He decided that Hushpad must have run away when the man left. Perhaps even now she was hiding in the forest, needing his company and friendship. All that afternoon he roamed the wooded places, calling and hallooing, but could find no trace of his friend. When evening came, he went to Thinbone for help, but the two of them had no more luck than Fritty alone. They ranged far and wide and asked all the folk they met for tidings, but none could help. In this way ended the first day of Tail Chaser's search for the lost hushpad. Three more sunrises passed without any sign of the young Fela. Fritty found it hard to believe that she would simply leave the area, but no trace of violence had been found, and the other folk had not seen or heard anything out of the ordinary. Day in and day out, he continued searching for her, tired but with a terrible, relentless need. First his family and his birthing place, now this. Even Thinbone gave up after the third day. Tail chaser, tail chaser, I, I, I know it's a terrible thing, his friend said. But sometimes Mirslar calls and we go. You know that. Finbone looked down, searching for words. Hushpad, that's gone. That is that, I'm afraid. Freddy nodded his understanding, and Finbone went off to join the other folk. Tailchaser, however, did not plan to give up his search. He knew what Finbone said to be true, but felt strongly in a manner he did not fully understand that Hushpad had not gone to Mirslar, but was living somewhere in the fields of the earth and needed his help. A few days later, Fritty was sniffing his way through a hedge of privet in which he and Hushpad had played many games of roll and pounce when he met Stretch Slow. The older hunter made less noise than the wind-tossed autumn leaves as he approached his tawny body moving with confident economy. When he reached Fritty, who was terribly self-conscious in the presence of the mature male, Stretch Slow stopped, sat back on his haunches, and gave the young cat an appraising stare. 
Trying to bob his head respectfully, Tailchaser caught his nose on a privet twig and let out an embarrassed mew of pain. Stretch Slow's cool observation softened into a look of amusement. Very foul, Stretch Slow, said Freddy. Uh, are you, uh, are you enjoying the sun today? He ended with an awkward gesture, and since the day was quite gray and overcast, he suddenly wished he had said nothing at all, perhaps even stayed underneath the privet bush. Seeing the young, younger cat so discomfited, Stretch Slow sneezed a laugh and sank to the ground. He reclined there lazily, head held high and his body appearing misleadingly relaxed. Good dancing to you, little one, he responded, then paused for a magnificent yawn. I see you're still hunting about for, what's her name? Squash Pod, was it? Hush pad. Yes, I'm still looking. Well, the older male looked about for a bit, as if searching for a tiny, insignificant thing he might have dropped. Finally, he said, oh, oh yes, that, that was it, of course. You'll want to come to the nose meet tonight. What? Freddy was flabbergasted. Nose meets were for elders and hunters and were reserved for important business. Why should I go to the nose meet? He gasped. Well, Stretch Low yawned again. From what I understand, although Harar knows, I have better things to do than keep track of all the comings and goings of you youngsters. From what I gather, it seems there have been many disappearances since last meeting. Six or seven, including your little friend Peach Pit. Hush, Pat. Freddy corrected him quietly, but Stretch Slow was gone. Above the wall, Mirslar's eye hung and gleamed, framing a sovereign wink against the black of the night. We have had this problem also, and some of the mothers are getting very worried. They aren't pleasant to be around at all lately. Suspicious, you know? The speaker was Mud Tracker, who lived with another colony of the folk on the other side of Edge Copse. They had their own meetings and seldom had more than passing contact with Freddy's clan. Oh, what I mean is, continued Mud Tracker, well, it, it is natural. I mean, we lose a couple of kittens every season, of course, and, oh, I'm the occasional male who decides to move on without telling anyone. Fail of troubles, usually, if you sniff my meaning. But we've seen three disappear in the past parcel of days. It's not natural. The visiting cat from the far side of the cop sat down, and there was a rustle of low hisses and whispers among the gathered clan leaders. Fritty's excitement at being at nose meet with the adults was beginning to fade. As he heard the stories that the others told of mysterious, mysterious absences and saw the way the sage Wise cats around him shook their heads and scratched their masks in puzzlement. He suddenly began to wonder if they would be any help at all in finding Hushpad. It had seemed to him that as soon as the older cats had acknowledged his problem, it could be solved. But look there. The brows and noses of the clan's protectors of tradition were wrinkled with worry. Tailchaser felt a sense of emptiness. Jump Tall, one of the youngest present, though older than Freddy by several seasons, stood to speak. My nest sister, my nest sister, Flicker Swift, had, had two of her kittens vanish, just I last. She is a watchful mother. They were playing at the base of that old Searsy tree at Forest's Edge, and she had turned for a moment, because her youngest was having a difficult furball. When she turned around again, they were gone and no smell of, of owl or fox. She looked everywhere, as you could imagine. She's very upset. Here Jump Tall paused awkwardly, then sat down. Earpoint rose and looked around the gathering. Yes, well, if no one has any more of these uh, stories, Stretch Slow raised a grudging paw. Pardon, Earpoint, I, I do believe. Where is he? Ah, yes, there he is. Young tail chaser there has something to report. 
if it's not too much bother, I mean. Stretch slow yawn, showing his sharp canines. Tail chewer, said Earpoint irritably. What kind of name is that? Bristlejaw smiled at Freddy. It's Tail Chaser, isn't it? Speak up, youngling. There you go. All eyes turned to Tail Chaser. Um, well, um, a sickly expression made his whiskers droop. Well, uh, you see, Hushpad, she's my friend. She's a, she, Hushpad is, well, she's disappeared. Old Snifflick leaned over and stared at him keenly. Did you see anything of what happened to her? Uh, no, no, sir, but I think, right. Earpoint leaned over and gave Freddy a brusque paw pat on the top of the head, nearly upsetting him. Right, continued Earpoint. Very good, yes. Thank you, tail, tail, tail. Well, it was a most useful report, young fellow. Now, shall we get on with it? Freddy sat down hastily and pretended to search for a flea. His nose felt hot. Wavetail, another elder, cleared his throat, puncturing several moments of uncomfortable stillness, and asked, But what are we going to do? Another moment's pause, and then the gathered folk all broke out at once. Alert the clans! Post sentries! Move away! No more having kittens! This last was from Jump Tall, who, seeing the others all staring at him, was suddenly plagued by Tail Chaser's flea. Old Snifflick climbed ponderously up onto his paws. He looked severely at Jump Tall, then gazed around at the waiting folk. First, he growled, we had better begin by agreeing not to go yelling and leaping about in this manner. A chipmunk with a bumblebee in his tail would make less noise and to more effect. Now, let's review the situation. He stared impressively at the ground as if mustering deep thoughts. First, an unusually large number of the folk have gone missing. Second, we have no idea what or who may be causing this. Third, the best and the wisest cats from around our woods are here tonight at nose meat and cannot solve the puzzle. Therefore, Snifflick paused to savor the effect. Therefore, although I agree that guards and such need to be discussed, I think it important that wiser minds than, yes, even ours, should be let to know of this situation. Baffling and affrighting as it is, we have no choice but to inform certain others about this situation. I suggest we should send a delegation to the court of Harar. It is our duty to inform the Queen of Cats. Entirely pleased with himself, Snifflick sat down as consternation and surprise whirled around him. To the court of Harar, breathed Mudtracker, none of the folk of Behind Edge Cops have been to the seat of the first for twenty generations. There was more excited rumbling. Neither have the folk from this side of the woods, said Bristlejaw, but I think Snifflick is right. We have heard these stories all night long, and no one has the slightest idea of what to do. This may be beyond us. I agree to a delegation. The crowd quieted for a moment, then two of the assembly blurted out at the same instant, Who will go? This started another uproar, and Earpoint had to shoot his claws and wave them around purposefully before things were quiet again. Snifflick spoke. Well, it will be quite a long and dangerous journey. I suppose that as I am senior elder, and my knowledge, that my knowledge and wisdom will be needed. I will go. Before anyone could react to this, there was a sudden snarl from the back of the gathering and Twitchnose was striding forward. She was Snifflick's mate, had borne innumerable litters by him, and she was a taker of no nonsense. She marched straight to Snifflick and stared him in the eye. 
You aren't going anywhere, you old mouse gummer. You think you're going to sail out into the wilderness and sing your horrible hunting songs all night while I sit here like a hedgehog, she hissed. Think you're going to find some slender young fella at the court, do you? By the time you mount her with those tired old bones, she'll be as old as I am. So what's the difference, you old villain? Trying to save Snifflick, Bristlejaw quickly said, That's, that's right, Snifflick. I mean, you shouldn't go. The folk here need your wisdom. No, a long journey of this kind calls for young cats. Cats who can travel in the winter time. He looked around, and as his eye passed over Freddy, the young cat felt a moment of impossible excitement. Bristlejaw's gaze moved on, though, and settled on Earpoint. The weathered old Tom rose under the eye of the master old singer and stood waiting. Earpoint, you have seen many summers, said Bristlejaw, but you are still strong and wise in the ways of the outer forest. Will you lead the delegation? Earpoint inclined his head in assent. Bristlejaw then turned to jump tall, who leaped to his feet and stood, seeming to hold his breath. You go also, young hunter, spoke the lore singer. Be aware of what an honor there is in your choice, and behave accordingly. Jump Tall nodded weakly and sat down. Bristlejaw turned to Snifflick, who had been carrying on a near silent thumping match with Twitch Nose. Old friend, will you pick one more emissary? he asked. Snifflick returned his attention to the nose meat once more and looked cannily around the circle. The assembled folk held their breath as one while he deliberated. Finally, he beckoned to Streamhopper, a youthful hunter of three summers. Tail Chaser felt a pang of disappointment, although he knew he was too young to have had a chance. As Snifflick and Bristlejaw instructed Streamhopper on his great responsibility, Pretty felt a curious frustration gnaw at his, at his heart. When the three delegates were assembled, Earpoint stood forward to receive the message that they would carry to the ancient court of Harar. Snifflick rose again. None here has traveled where you must go, he began. We have no sure knowledge to guide you, but the songs that tell of the court are known to all. If you are able, to discharge this duty and reach the queen of the folk, tell her that the elders of the meeting wall, this side of Edge Copse, under the eaves of the old wood, on the fringe of her domain, pledge their fealty and ask for her help and guidance in this manner. Tell her that this plague of disappearances has visited not just the kittenry and questing males, but Hurrah! Curse it, the entire tribe! Tell her we are bewildered and can find no wisdom in this matter. If she will send a message, you are charged to bring it back with you. He paused. Oh, uh, yes, you are hereby bound to help and aid your companions. Up to, but not including, the failure of your charge. Here Snifflick halted again, and in a moment was once more the oldest cat of the meeting wall folk. He looked at the ground for a moment and scrabbled his paw in the dirt. We, we all hope that Mir Sla All Mother will watch over you and keep you safe, he added. He did not look up. You may tell your families, but we wish you to leave as soon as possible. May you find luck dancing, Whistlejaw said. Then after a moment, this nose meat is ended. Almost all the folk who were present rose and pushed forward, some to talk excitedly among themselves, others to get a last sniff or offer a last word to the three delegates. Pretty Tail Chaser was the only cat who did not stay for at least a moment with the brave delegation. He climbed away from the wall, buzzing with unfamiliar feelings. At the lip of the hollow, he stood scratching his claws through the rough bark of an elm tree, listening to the murmur of the crowding cats below. Nobody at the nose meat cared about Hushpad, he thought. Nobody would remember her name when the delegates reached the court. 
Stretchlow couldn't even remember it now. Hushpad didn't mean a, a jot more to any of them than the scruffiest old Tom. Yet he was supposed to wait patiently while Jump Tall and the rest went parading off to the court of the Queen in the hope that she would solve the problem. Heavenly Viror, what nonsense! Freddy growled a noise that he had never made before and ripped off another skein of bark. He turned and stared into the sky. Somewhere, he felt sure, Hushpad was staring up at the same eye, and no one cared but him whether she was in danger or not. Well then, Tail Chaser felt hot determination as he stood on the hillside, head and tail arched. The orb of Mirslar hung above him like a shaming parent as he made an impassioned pledge. By the tales of the firstborn, I will find Hushpad, or my or my spirit will fly my dying body, one or the other. After a moment, when he realized what he had promised, Fritty began to shiver. And that is the end of chapter three. So we got through two chapters, so maybe, I never know these things until I actually read them. So maybe we'll still be about 12 episodes altogether or something. No, 18. Uh, so, uh, so still quite a bit. So I'm glad I'm reading it broken up. Anyway, so that is chapters two and three of Tail Chaser's Song. I will be reading the next section Friday, my time, 2 a.m. Sorry, Sunday. Just confused myself. Sunday, my time, 2 a.m. And then I'll be reading the part after that this same time next week. But as I said, all these things are posted in various places. I mentioned it on my Facebook page in the last, um, the, the first post about this today. Um, and uh, the, the one with the horrible baby doll on it, I think. But I'm not sure about that. No, it was the one before it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. If you want to find out where to find it, you can. And until that point, I just want to say, please, all of you, again, um, please keep our friend Alexis in your thoughts and prayers. Um, as we wait to see how that's going, um, Alexis, get well, be better, thinking about you, worrying about you. And for all the rest of you, I hope you're all well, and I hope you're staying that way, and you and your friends and loved ones and your neighbors and everybody. And if you're out protesting, wear a mask. Um, if you are out shopping, wear a mask. If you're out trick-or-treating, you're early. Other than that, wear a mask. I hope that's all clear, okay? And uh, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for really just being part of this. It's really strange to think about how long ago this was and to think about today and uh, what I would have thought about this when I was writing those words on my round dining room table back in my apartment in Menlo Park in 1985. Long time ago very strange. Anyway, so thank you for sharing this voyage down memory lane with me, this cat hair covered voyage down memory lane. Until next week, take care of yourself. Lots